Matthew chapter 4, verse number 18, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Two questions I want to ask you just as a quick introduction about this verse. The first one is this, if these two men follow Jesus, would they catch men, true or false? Obviously, the answer is true. Jesus said the responsibility for the making was his, and the responsibility for the following is ours. By the way, that word make there is the verb tense is continual process. In other words, Jesus begins the making, and the process never stops. I don't care if you're 80 years old or 8 years old in here tonight. Jesus Christ still wants to make us fishers of men and catching men. Amen? Second question. Based on verse 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If they did not from that moment going forward catch men, then they were guilty of not following Jesus. True or false? Obviously, again, the answer, unfortunately, uh, in spite of the conviction it may bring, is true. And may I say to you and I tonight, if we're not influencing people to go to heaven, then we are not following Jesus. I don't care what other good things we may be doing, going to church, praying, tithing, giving, all those things are important and must be done. But Jesus said, follow me and I will, not I might, not I should, I will make you fishers of men. Soul winning, many times people say, well, I don't have that gift. I want to start out by saying tonight, soul winning is not a gift. It is obedience to a commandment. Amen? So, for sake of definition tonight, when I preach and teach on this, a first-time soul winner involves four things. It involves, first of all, someone who wins someone to Christ, they do it outside the church. I know we can lead people to the Lord at the altar in the Sunday school class, but a first-time soul winner, for my definition, is you, you win someone to Christ, but you do it outside the church. Number three, you do it on purpose. What do I mean by that? I simply mean that when you're talking to them, your whole purpose is you started the conversation to win them to Jesus Christ. And four, you're using a plan. Now I want you to bow your heads for one moment. We're going to start with an invitation and end. I just want to ask you a question. I want you to have privacy to answer honestly. No matter who you are tonight, how many would say, uh, Brother Brian, I have never, according to your definition, I am not a first-time soul winner. I have never led someone to Christ outside the church on purpose using a plan. Would you just slip your hand up? No one's looking. I'm not going to embarrass you. I see hands up. Keep, keep putting them up. Preacher, I'm, I'm, that's me. All right, thank you. Hands up several places across the auditorium. Now, what I want to do tonight is show you how you can change that. First Wednesday night of 2021, I know of no greater commitment that we could make than to win someone to Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you how. Why is that important? Because inspiration without education always leads to frustration. I can inspire you, I can motivate you, I can challenge you. The verse I gave in Matthew 4, 19 challenges me. But if I don't show you how, all you're going to do is be frustrated. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump right into uh, 13 steps. You should have a handout. If you don't, just let, raise your hand. I'm sure they'll still be more than glad to give you one and uh, show you how you can win someone to Jesus Christ. Father, I love you, and I need your help now, and I pray that you anoint me and use me. God, without you, I'm nothing. And Lord, I need your power and your presence I'm preaching and teaching to people tonight that have been saved for years. There's doctors and scholars and college professors in here that know way more than I do. I do not claim to be an expert. I do not claim to have all the answers. But God, what I do know is that you put it in my heart years ago and showed me the importance of what I'm fixing to teach. So I pray you use it. May my excitement and zeal and desire for this subject catch someone else's heart, but at the same time help me to be able to teach in such a way that they leave here tonight, even if someone has won many people, that they get something to further their toolbox in this area of soul winning. Help us and touch us now. In Jesus' name, amen 
and amen. Now, I want you to notice on that paper, you've got 13 steps. Those 13 steps, I'm going to divide into four divisions. Plus, along the way, I'm going to give you four golden keys that deal with the character of soul winning. And I'll let you know when I get to them. So, we're going to use fishing terms because Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I think that's a good illustration for us to understand. So, division number one, I want you to notice first of all, we've got to cast the net right. Cast the the net right. In other words, how do you get on subject? Have you ever wanted to witness, but you didn't know what to say? Or you, you wasn't sure how to begin or, or, or what to do? I'm going to give you three steps under this, the first three steps of casting the net, and all three of them are going to be questions. Why is that important? Well, because asking questions, you're not offending someone. You're, you're engaging them. You're not telling them, but you're engaging them. And always remember, questions stir the conscience, but accusations harden the wheel. So you want to ask questions. Now, I want to say this and preface this up front. Understand that tonight I'm talking about technique. I'm going to give you step by step. But please don't misunderstand that in no way am I saying, and I want to make clear, you must have the power of the Holy Ghost if you're going to witness. You cannot leave the Spirit of God out of this. So when we teach step by step, we're not saying ignore the Spirit of God. I'm just jumping right in and assuming that you have prayed. Never go soul winning. Never talk to someone, even if under your breath you don't pray and say, God, help me to submit to you and listen to you and give me the power I need. In the flesh, we will win nobody of any eternal value, make any eternal difference in their life. But with the Spirit of God, we can do all things. So I'm not going to skip a lot of that. I'm just saying you cannot soul win and be effective without the power of God. But tonight, I'm going to address technique. So let's jump right in. Step number one. First question you're going to ask is, what is your background? And with this, you're going to give your testimony. Now, have you ever started witnessing and embarrassed them or yourself? My have. By the way, I'm going to deal along the way with mistakes you make and understand I've made every one of them. I got saved, and without going into a lot of detail, the crowd I got saved in was almost against soul winning. They wouldn't have put it that way, but they didn't like one, two, three, and they didn't like tracks, and they didn't like, that's the, I got saved, and, and that's the crowd that kind of taught me. And, and along the way, what I found out as a missionary in Papua New Guinea, and then working a mission work in, other, in West Virginia, and then taking a church, I found out that, that soul winning does work. And what most people are against is not soul winning. They're against what they perceive to be the wrong way, because their way is the only right way. Well, when I get done with my 13 plan, you may not like everything. Can I tell you that's okay? If you don't like mine, can I ask you a question, what's yours? And if you tell me nothing, I like my 13-point plan better than your nothing. Amen? So cast the net right. And first question, what is your church background? In other words, we're asking this question so we can get on subject, and we're doing it in such a way as not to offend. And when you ask this question, you're going to get a plethora of answers, and no matter the response, you're going to say something positive. There's two attitude words in soul winning you need to get down. You should have a place to write them on your paper. Great. Wonderful. Can y'all say them with me? Great. Wonderful. You need to memorize them. I don't care what they tell you. Hey, what's your church background? I am a Catholic. Man, that's great. Are we saying it's great they're Catholic? No, but we're going to find something positive to try to stay on track. That's not where you want to say, I tell you right now, I'm not going to follow some of the dresses like mama calls himself Papa. No, 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 no. You just lost them. You're going to say something positive. You're going to say something. You're going to say, you know what? I, the other day I had someone tell me they were Catholic. And you know what I said? I said, you know what? I passed, I passed the church the other day, and I'm telling you it was one of the most, y'all got some of the prettiest sanctuaries and churches I've seen. 
I, I went and talked to my neighbor not long ago, and I said, what's your church background? He said, I'm Lutheran. I said, and, he said, and he told me where he went to church. I said, that's one of the prettiest churches in the country I've laid out, and it is. It's beautiful. And uh, I'm just saying, no matter what they tell you, you're going to find something positive, something wonderful. You're not going to offend. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. And we're asking in such a way to get on subject. No matter the response, no matter what they tell you. I'm, I'm in the church of Wicca. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, that's, uh, that's one of the most unique organizations I've ever heard of. It's great. I get a chance to talk to you. See, I'm going to find some way to not be negative. Why? Uh, listen, I wasn't raised a Baptist. I was raised in a cult. I was not raised in the truth. And when someone come at me, it didn't make me want to listen to them. It made me want to fight them. So you want to stay positive. Amen? Not only uh, do we want to stay positive, but listen to me. You're not there to straighten their theology, but to get them saved. We got to get them saved to get them doctrinally right. And to get saved, I understand, they must be right on the doctrine of atonement. They must know that Jesus died for their sins, paid for their sins. They have to believe that he's the only way to get to heaven. But that's all the doctrine they've got to have. So make sure that, you, listen, you don't get a man good to get him saved. You get a man saved to get him good. Amen. So once you have answered positively, then you're going to give your testimony. Once they say, uh, just the other day, I was talking to someone, that same fellow, he said he's Lutheran. I said, well, you know what? I can understand. I said, I was raised in the Church of Christ. And, and I said, uh, you know, and I gave my testimony. You want to keep your testimony to about a minute, no longer? Hey, listen, one of the most effective ways you can witness is learn to give an effective testimony. Make sure that you, in that testimony, make sure that you talk about your religious background and how you heard the gospel and how God dealt with your life and maybe the circumstances surrounding you being saved, but keep it to about a minute. When I talked to someone, when I talked to him, I said, you know, I wasn't raised, I didn't get saved till later in life. I was raised in the church of Christ and they taught me that you had to work for it, you had to earn it, you had to be baptized. And one day my senior year, two, uh, two Southern Baptist girls started talking to me in psychology class showed me the truth and it got me questioning and through that I got saved gave my heart to Jesus it don't have to be long but make sure it's effective make sure you give your testimony a lot of effective gospel witnessing is through an effective testimony and many people never learn how to give a proper testimony so that's step number one. What's your religious background? You're just wanting to get on subject. You're wanting to get them going the right direction. Step number two. The second question you're going to ask them is if you should die right now, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? Now you can ask that several ways and it'd be just fine, but I'm going to ask you to memorize it that way till you become proficient. And then ask it how God leads you. Now this question shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be embarrassing. You want to look them in the eyes. You want to make sure you've asked God to break your heart and have compassion and brokenness. And you want to ask them, I'm going to use the, the name Joe throughout this. Joe, man, based on what you told me, I want to ask you this. If you died today, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? You want to have compassion. People don't know how much, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. I know you know that. And so uh, you're asking this so you can qualify your prospect. What do you mean qualify? Are they saved or are they lost? Now, maybe they say to you, well, I get this all the time. If, uh, if y'all can tell, I'm from the South. Maybe you can't tell. My home church is First Baptist Church of Bridgeport, Michigan, but I'm not from there. I know that would be hard for y'all to figure out with the lack of accent. And down in the south, when I witness all the time, here's the number one answer I get. If you die today, do you, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? I get, I hope so. Have you ever got that before? Maybe they say they hope so. Now, I'm not going to look negative. I'm not going to jump right there and say, no, no, you got to have a no. So, no, 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 no. We're not there at this moment. All I'm going to do is smile 
I'm going to think but not say, probably lost. I'm going to stay positive, and then I'm going to go to step three. Maybe they say to me, well, you know, I, I think I am. What are you going to think? Lost. You're not going to say that, but you're going to think that. Maybe they say I had this not long ago. Well, I know I'm a Christian because a blue light come in my room. That was their answer to that question. I didn't jump on blue lights and talk about how wrong that was. I simply qualified my prospect. Definitely lost. And I'm going to go to step three. Okay? Now understand, you're not going, you know, if they say, if they say, yes, I'm going to heaven, does that mean they're going to heaven? No, it does not. My next question then is going to be, that's great. Tell me how long you've been saved. Just the other day, someone said, well, I've been, I can't tell you of a time that I wasn't saved. In my mind, I'm smiling. But what am I thinking? Lost. Maybe they say, maybe they give that story. I've had all kinds. I had one say, well, I was sick and I was in the hospital and, and, a, and a preacher come through as a woman preacher and, and she laid hands on me and spoke in tongues. And I'm telling you, preacher, just, just the, the hair stood up all over my body and I had a different feeling and I got to go home the next day and my sickness was gone. And that's how I know I'm going to heaven. I'm qualifying. I'm not saying inward. I'm thinking, oh my word, how stupid. Outwardly, I'm smiling. That's great you got out of the hospital. That's great that you got healed. But in my mind, I'm thinking, lost, and I'm going to step three. Maybe they give you a good, clear testimony of salvation. They tell you, and what sounds good, we're not the Holy Ghost, but there's nothing in there. Then you're going to say, praise the Lord, shake their hand, rejoice that they're saved, and move on. But if there's any doubt, go to step number three. What is step number three? Remember, we're, 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 we're just on qualifying. We're making sure we're casting the net. We're getting on subject. How, how do you get on subject? By these questions. What's the third question? The third question is simply, could I take just a moment and show you how you can know for sure? Ain't that a great question? I love getting to that point. At this point, it's going to be important. You have a New Testament soul winner's edition somewhere. We sell a great one through David Wood Ministries. I recommend it highly, but you're going to have it in your pocket, maybe have it in your hand. Listen, I've made all these mistakes. When I, when I started out, and even for a long time, I carried a big old lanky Bible to the door. I've, no, I've seen guys carry books. Listen, you're going to scare them. They're going to think you're a Jehovah's Witness. They're going to think you're a Mormon or a moron. Are they going to think you're a religious zealot? Hey, listen, just, care. I just keep a New Testament in your back pocket somewhere handy. It's unobtrusive. It's small. But as you ask this question, could I take just a moment and show you how you can know for sure? You're going to just simply, as you ask that question, pull out the Bible. You're not going to say nothing. You're not going to start reading. But you're just, as you're asking that question, you're going to open it right to Romans 3, the book of Romans, because that's where you're going to be for this plan. I know there's other verses that can be used, but Romans does a great job. Amen? And, and so you're going to go pull it out, and you're going to presume, and this is the right kind of presumption, that they are going to let you present the gospel and show them how they could be saved. So it's going to work something like this. Joe, could I take just a moment and show you a couple verses that help me know for sure uh, that I was going to heaven? Would that be all right? I'm not being dictatorial. I'm not being unobtrusive. I'm asking. Very few people will ever turn you down. Your Bible's open. You've already got it right there to the first verse that you want, and you're going to take that time. That's step number three. Now, on your page at the bottom, you should have golden keys in a place for four. We're going to stop right here before we get to step number four, and I want to give you step or golden key number one because it's important. Golden key number one is simply this. It's going to be a term that is, is, is great. I like it, especially being in the South. But be folksy. Be folks, Preacher, what do you mean be folksy? Be friendly. Be down home. Be a person someone wants to be around. 
one of the greatest things you will do is practice becoming being interested in people. Most of the time, we're not interested in people. You ever been talking to someone and they're telling you a story and your mind's already racing the story, you want to tell them that's better than their story and you don't even hear half of what they say because you're just thinking about what you want to tell them. Learn to listen and become more interested in what they're saying and what, who they are than what you want to say or what you want to do. When people talk about a person having a great charisma or personality, most of the time what they mean is that person is interested in me. That person is friendly. And so uh, you're going to, uh, listen, you're not going to build a great church and you're not going to be a great soul winner without being friendly. You don't want to be cheesy. Y'all know what I mean. Fake, phony, be real, be genuine. But ask God to help you to be folks in. When you walk up to the door and when you talk to someone, you're not just going to jump right in. I would hope not. I did this as a young Christian that never worked and say, hey, if you died right now, you know you go to heaven. You're not going to get very far with that person. So you got to engage them. You're going to have to be friendly. You may have to talk about uh, their house or their neighborhood or their car or their flowers. Listen, and, and I've made all these mistakes. Again, I want you to be positive. I, I'm a huge college football fan, and, and my wife is from Knoxville, and we love the Tennessee Vols. My home, our home church is in West Virginia. Then I worked out of missions, and I like the West Virginia Mountaineers. And those are two teams that where I pastored in Virginia, people hated because they were Virginia. Virginia Tech fans, and I couldn't, I, I despise Virginia Tech. Now you say, well, preacher, that shouldn't matter. Hey, the lost man, you criticize his team, you just, you just lost. I can't tell you how many times I made the mistake. I'd walk up to someone's house, I'd have Virginia Tech. I'd say, how you doing? They'd say, fine. Say, yeah, I'm so, say, I noticed that Virginia Tech, uh, know that, that Virginia Tech flag. I, Boy, y'all are sorry. Now, I was just trying to make conversation. You're not starting off on a good foot. So I had to find some way, no matter how much it burnt me inside, to say something nice. You're being positive. You're being folksy. You're being friendly. You're talking to relax them. Maybe ask them where they work, about their children, comment on the neatness of their house if you're inside, or trophies that they have, or the woodwork, or whatever it takes. You're relaxing them. And can I ask you a question? When you go to witness, who do you think's more nervous, you or them? They are. Well, preacher, they're going to fall over with a heart attack if they're more nervous than me because my heart's beating out of my chest. That may be so, but they're more nervous than you are. Be folksy. Amen. And then when it's relaxed, go on to step number one. It becomes a natural transition about their church background and moving in. So, number one, cast the net right. But then let's go to division number two. And the second division is use the right bait. In other words, explain to them how they can be saved. You usually do not catch fish unless you do it illegally with an empty hook. You got to have bait on it. Now, I know a bunch of rednecks that, you know, used triple hooks, and, and, but that's illegal. God don't want us, we're not trying to trick or force anybody. So if we're going to, uh, we got to use the right bait. In other words, explain to them how they can be saved. And I want you to notice step number four. We're not calling it step one under division two. It's step four. We're going to follow the plans. It's important we do them in order. And, and, and notice I said step four is teach him that he is a sinner. Teach him. Notice I said teach him that he is a sinner. See, the Great Commission said we're to preach the gospel and teach we leave that out in this. They most of the time do not know salvation and the gospel. And even if they know the Bible and grew up in church and not saved, all they can know is fleshly and carnal. They can't know the spiritual things. It's our job to teach them. You're going to teach them that they're a sinner. How are you going to do that? Your Bible's open. You're going you're gonna to be right there in Romans 3.23. You're going to look at Joe, always read the verse twice. You've already asked him. They've nodded or said yes. Could I take just a moment and show you how you can know for sure? And then you say, Joe, here in Romans 3.23, I want you to look at it with me. The Bible said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Joe, you know what that means? For all, that means that right now as I talk to you, God says I'm a sinner. If you had a partner with you, that means so-and-so's a sinner. And Joe, ultimately, that means you are a sinner. And you're going to read again, Joe, let me, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Joe, we're all sinners. You know what I found? Very few people argue with me on this point. They know they're a sinner. 
I'll look at them and say, now that ain't hard to admit, is it? We know we've messed up, stole cookies from the cookie jar, cussed, thought something we shouldn't, whatever. Very few people argue, yeah, you're, you're right. I may not be as bad as so-and-so, but yeah, I'm not perfect. Teach them that they're a sinner. That's our job. And then when you do that, step number five, you're going to teach them that they're going to hell because of their sin. Teach them that he's going to hell because of his sin. Romans 6, 23, you're going to turn there and you're going to read it. Joe, the Bible said, for the wages of sin is death. And I'm going to stop right there because that's what I'm talking about. Joe, do you get that? For the wages of sin is death. Do not, at this point, I can't tell you how many people I've heard that that, that deal with soul winning or in our modern day, they want to minimize hell. Do not say, well, you know, you'll go to Hades. You'll go to that bad place. No, Jesus used the word hell and heaven. We have a liberal movement that's trying to remove the awfulness of hell. We need to make sure we're plain. There is a hell to be shunned and a heaven to be gained. Don't minimize the punishment, the penalty. The wages of sin is death. Joe, do you understand that that word wage just simply, if you know what a wage is, Joe, it means that if you've worked for 40 hours, uh, you deserve, you've earned the wage of the check that your boss is going to give you. And God said that the penalty, that's the wage, the wage of my sin. You've already admitted you're a sinner. Don't matter what kind of sinner, you're a sinner. And because of that, the penalty, the wage is death. death is two things. It means that I lose my breath, my life, and I die physically, but the God also says I die spiritually, eternally. And to die spiritually means I'm spending an eternal, Christless eternity in hell without him if I die lost. You're going to teach him that he's going to hell because of his sin. Step number six, you're going to teach him that Jesus paid the penalty for his sins on the cross. You're going to open your Bible, your text there to Romans 5, 8, and you're going to read, but God commendeth his love toward us, Joe, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ain't that wonderful, Joe? Never get over the atonement. Never get over the blood. You ought to get excited as you're talking to them. I remember when God made this verse real to me. Joe, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, do you understand, Joe, that the wage has to be paid, the penalty has to be paid, and we can't pay it because we're sinners, but Jesus Jesus Christ paid that penalty. He took the wage. Now at this point, there's two questions that I'm going to look at Joe and ask. I'm going to ask him, Joe, how many people did Jesus die for on the cross? Even, even someone that don't know it's about the Bible, you know what they're going to tell you surprisingly? Everybody. You don't, you don't become a Calvinist on your own. Someone has to teach you to become a Calvinist. Lost people know Jesus died. And when you show them that, how many, how many people did Jesus die for on the cross? They'll say everyone. Well, Joe, that's true. So does that mean everybody's going to heaven? Believe it or not, he's smarter than a lot of Christians, and he'll say, no, not his head, or no, that, that's not what that means. At that point... I'm going to go on to step number seven. What is step number seven? I'm going to teach him that if he will believe and receive Jesus Christ, or Christ, God will save him. And while I'm talking, I'm going to be turning to Romans 10, number 13, and I'm going to read to him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to show him that. And I'm going to look at him and I'm going to say something along the lines of, Joe, it's one thing for me to write you a check for $100 and it's another thing for you to have the faith and the belief in that check to take it from me and cash it. See, it's one thing for you to know what I just told you, for you to know you're a sinner, for you to know that the, the penalty of sin is death. It's another thing for you to know that Jesus took that penalty. But Joe, it's another thing uh, that you've got to believe and receive Jesus Christ. And at this point, please hear me, I'm immediately going to go to step eight. 
Here's where I made mistake for years and years and years and lost so many people that I believe I could have won to the Lord. I'm going to move quickly from step seven to step eight. Because if I don't, you're going to commit one of the cardinal sins that I committed for years. And that is you're going to ask this person to take you somewhere you don't need to go or want to go. Here's how it goes. You've, you've taught him he's a sinner. You've told him he's going to hell. You've told him Jesus paid the penalty. You've taught him that if he'll believe and receive Christ, God will save him. And then we say something like this. Death knell questions. Don't ever ask these. So what do you think about this so far? Or would you like to take some time to think about that? No. Though those are questions you, you don't want to ask or, you know, or, or do you have any questions? No, don't ever do that. Go immediately from telling him that if he will believe and receive Christ, God will save him. You have instructed him on how to become a Christian, so you want to get to step eight immediately. Now, before I get to step eight, let me give you golden key number two. And golden key number two is important. All of them are important, but golden key number two is important, and here it is. Stay on the track. Stay on the track. Don't get off subject. Let me introduce the key this way. Most of the problems and questions and fears about soul winning and people afraid to talk to someone could be answered in soul winning if we just practice key number two. The most common state over the years that I've heard as a pastor and a preacher, when you talk to people about witnessing or soul winning, they say, well, I'm scared. What if they ask me something I can't answer? Now, I dealt with this when I was here back the end of the year in my message, this one little point, and I'm, but I'm going to do it again because I think it's so important. Golden key number two is going to ensure literally that there is never a question asked that you can't answer. No matter what the question is. It don't matter how difficult it is. See, if we're not careful, we got to stay on track. We got to stay on progress. What do I mean stay on track? Step one, step two, three, four, and so on. We don't want to get off track. And at the end of step three and at the end of step seven is where the easiest transitions occur for someone to get off track. And more than likely after step three or step seven, they're going to ask a question. It may be something like, well, do I have to be a Baptist to believe? Or do I have to believe the King James Version of the Bible to do that? Or do I have to, uh, you know, whatever it may be, you, you'll get all kinds of questions. No matter what the question is, no matter, here is going to be your response. Well, Joe, that's a great question. Remember, great and wonderful. I'm so, I'm so glad that you're thinking and, and that you, your mind is working. And, and Joe, could I do this? And you're going to use your hands. Joe, could I, you're going you're gonna to take your hand, Joe, could I take that question? And could I set it over here? And you're going to put your hand way out over here. You still got your New Testament here. And let me finish showing you what I want to show you when you're going to have your New Testament in your hand. And Joe, when I finish showing you what I want to show you, it's going to help you have the answer to that question. Is that all right? Notice, I've not ignored their question. I've not tried to answer their question. I just said, Joe, if it be all right, could we take that question and set it over here and let me show you what I want to show you when I'm finished showing you what I want to show you. It will help answer that question that you have. Notice what I've done. I've complimented them. I've asked for their permission. What's the biblical reason for that? The biblical reason for that is in Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. The Bible said the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Before a saved man is saved, he, I don't care what answer you give him, he ain't going to understand it. The natural man understandeth not, receiveth not the things of God. And so what's going to happen is he's going to ask a question and you're going to try to instruct him in an area that he's not equipped to understand. And before he can be discipled, he has to be a disciple. Don't get off track. Amen. 
That's why back in step two, when they give an answer like, I hope so, hey, listen, don't instruct them. You'll get off track. I've made that mistake so many times in my life. Listen, we're not, you're not going to get them to understand doctrine. You, they say, maybe you say, uh, you know, if you ever, if you die today, do you know that you would go to heaven? And they say, well, at one time I was saved, but not now. What do we want to do as good Baptists? We jump into eternal security mode, jumping on the free will Baptist doctrine of losing your salvation. No, 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 no. Stay on track. That person's not going to understand. Do you realize when I got saved, y'all can believe it or not, I didn't know my salvation was for eternity. I was taught by the Church of Christ you had to work for it and lose it. Now, when I got saved, I believed I had to trust Jesus Christ as a Baptist preacher preaching. He preached the truth and I got saved. When I got saved, I believed in the general judgment. I didn't know no different. I learned a lot of things was wrong after I got saved. We got to get them saved. What do they got to know to get saved? That Jesus Christ is a Savior, that they're a sinner, and that if they'll trust in the atoning work of Christ, He'll save them. And ain't it a joy? After they get saved, then we show them how long they're saved. Amen. Stay on track. Amen. Go right into step four, five, six, seven. The Scripture and Spirit will answer the question. Stay on track. Now, let's go to division number three. Division number three is how do you draw the net right? In other words, how do you lead them to Christ? We don't want any spiritual cop-outs here. We don't want to stop right here and say, well, would you like to think about it? Guilty. Guilty of this one. Why don't you think about it and come to church with me Sunday? Well, those are all spiritual cop-outs. We're scared, fearful to go to the next. Well, what if they don't mean it? We're going to deal with that, but that's not my job. Have you taught him? Have you used the Word of God? The Word of God will not come back void. Trust the plan. So you can go to step eight. Step eight is immediately from step seven. You want to go to step eight? Step eight is bow your head in prayer and watch you pray. They're going to be scared to pray. Don't mention we're going to pray. We just say, I'm going to lead us. To bow your head and say something like, Joe, I want to have a word of prayer with you. And then you're going to pray. What are you praying for? what you want. What do you want? I'm going to pray something like this. Lord, I want to thank you. Joe has given me the opportunity to show him how he can go to heaven. And Lord, I pray right now that you help Joe understand, and I pray that you open his heart, and right now I pray that you help him to be willing to receive Jesus Christ right now. Amen. I'm not going to say amen. I'm going to stop with right now. Why? I'll get to that in just a moment. But listen, pray for what you want. You have not because you ask not. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Hey, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, is it God's will to save that individual? Then we ought to go in there with boldness on purpose. Trusting the Holy Ghost. Trusting the Word of God. So you're going to pray for exactly what you want. When you're done with step eight, you do not say amen. You do not lift your head. You're going to go to step nine. What is step nine? You're going to ask him to pray. He's going to repeat a phrase by phrase prayer after you. I'm going to ask him, Joe, here's, here's the way I put it. Joe, are you willing to receive Christ? Again, I'm not saying amen. My head's bowed, my eyes closed. I'm going to say something like this. Joe, if the Lord Jesus would receive you right now just like you are, and he will, would you be willing to receive him just like he is? In step nine, we're not trying to trick them. We're going to make sure they know that it is not a word step by step or a word by word prayer or saying a prayer. We're going to make clear that he's saved by placing his faith in what Jesus did for him on the cross. That's why I asked it, Joe, if the Lord Jesus would receive you just right now just like you are, would you be willing to receive him just like he is? Now it's important that you have them repeat a prayer after you. Here's where all the knocks and soul winning comes. I, I grew up in the, when I got saved as a young preacher in the camp of, bless God, repeat after me, he's out of hell. Oh, I heard that preached by men that I called their name. You would know their name. And I was taught as a young preacher in Bible college, it's wrong, don't ever do that. You're making people twofold the child of hell. Well, here's the problem with that. It took me years to figure it out, I'm ashamed to admit. 
Did you notice in all the steps I said, teach him, teach him, teach him? And then we come to the prayer, and, and I did it something like this. Okay, now what I want you to do is I'm going to pray. I can't pray for you. You're going to pray, and you ask God to save you. This person don't know anything. I've taught them up to this point, and then I'm just going to leave it to them? No. Or I finally got to the place that say, you know what? I know you may be scared to pray all that. They get embarrassed. They don't know what to say. They're afraid to say the wrong thing. Or, or you'll say, well, you pray quietly, and I'll pray aloud. Well, now you don't even know what they're praying. The Lord Jesus said, when you pray, say. And that was not the model prayer, but that was a demonstration of how we ought to pray. There's nothing wrong with asking him, hey, I've taught you this, taught you this, taught you this. Now I'm going to lead you. He that winneth souls. What's the winneth part? We don't save their soul, but we're the one leading them into that. Don't stop here with the prayer. I made mistake for a year, and I regret it, and it's to my shame. I found when I said, here's what I want you to do. I just prayed, Joe, and now, Joe, I'm going to ask you to pray. Would you receive Jesus Christ if he will take you right now as you are? Would you take him just as he is? And, he, and I'm going to ask him if he says yes and acknowledges that, and if he understands that. Listen, I'm going to say, okay, Joe, what I want you to do is I want you to repeat after me. I'm going to go slow, and I want you to, I want you to repeat after me. And I'm going to pray something like this, dear God. Joe's going to say, dear God. I know that I'm a sinner. Notice our heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. We've still not let go of the prayer. And I'm going to say, uh, Lord, uh, Joe's, I'm going to lead Joe. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. I repent of my sin. Please forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save me. Uh, to the best I know how, I'm receiving Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen. Add, add, take away, do what you want. I believe what he did for me on the cross. I trust you with all my heart. Uh, just whatever you want to say amen but you're not going to stop there just yet after you lead them through that prayer do not say amen because we're going to go to step number 10 what is step number 10 step number 10 is you're going to say Joe you're still praying your head's bowed you're going to say Joe I want you to take my hand ask him to take your hand if he meant business I want you to take my hand if you meant what you just prayed, Joe. And if they take your hand, they're acknowledging that it's not just your prayer, it's their prayer. You're going to take their hand. And, and, and then you're going to go to step 11. Step 11 is you're going to pray with thanksgiving, rejoicing, and assurance. And now at the end of that, you're going to say amen to that prayer and shake their hand. When you pray, you're not going to pray something like this. Now, Lord, if Joe meant it. That's a skeptic in us. Now, Lord, I don't know if Joe meant it or not, but I know if he meant what you said, if meant what he said, you say, no, 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 no. We're going to give them assurance. They just took your hand. Don't call them a liar. They said they meant it. You're going to give them assurance, Lord, I want to thank you that you have saved Joe, that you let me run into him and that you let me present the gospel and that he received Jesus Christ as his Savior. And Lord, you're going to thank God and rejoice and give him assurance. That leads me to golden key number three. I'm about done. Golden key number three is, listen to this, never, never Never, 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 ever, ever, ever offend or embarrass anyone. And don't ever embarrass, don't ever offend or intimidate. Can I tell you how many times over the years it almost become a badge if we're not careful in our soul winning in our Baptist church. You ever go to soul winning and you come back and someone you say, well, did you win anybody? No, but I tell you right now, I had this Pentecost, I, read, I gave them a piece of my mind. Yeah, you know what you also did? Probably rent it for anyone else to ever win them to Jesus. Listen to me tonight. If you can't win someone to Christ, always leave him or her so the next person can. Never, 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 never embarrass anybody. Now let's go to division four. How do you keep what you catch? How to keep what you catch? What good does it do to catch fish and then let them lay in a bucket? or lay on the shore, or sit on the stringer and die. 
Jesus said he wants us to have fruit that remains. The three steps of the Great Commission, if you look at all of it together, is win someone to Christ, get them baptized, and then train them. Jesus said, whatsoever things I have commanded you, what did he command them? To go give the gospel and get someone saved. So he wants us to take that new convert and immediately train them how to win someone else to Christ. We are to be reproducing reproducers. So how do we do that? How do we keep what we catch? Well, step 12 we have to give them assurance of salvation. Well, preacher, I'm not going to do that, you know, because I don't know. Now, wait a minute. Then it's your fault. Because if you took the Word of God and you presented those verses and you were clear in salvation and they said they wanted it and they accepted it, who's lying? See, it's almost as if we become fruit inspectors and we decided somewhere along the way in Baptist circles and some Baptist circles, we're going to judge whether they meant it or not. That's not my job. They've prayed. They've asked the Lord to save them. So step 12, give them assurance of salvation. I'm going to open to Romans 10, 13, and I'm going to say, Joe, get this, for whosoever, Joe, whosoever, he's going to say, that's me, shall call upon the name of the Lord. Joe, did you do that? Yes, I did. Watch now, Joe. I'm, I'm going to read this wrong. Might be saved. No, 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 preacher, that's not what it says. Hopefully. No, no. It says shall. What's that mean? It means I'm saved. I'm going to show them that we're good because the devil's going to do everything he can to steal that away from them. Our ministry produces, it's a tremendous book that Brother David Woodrow called Fruit That Remains and it's simply a, a, a gospel of Romans and it has there, but in there it's got lessons and, and it shows them and has a certificate. You have a certificate, a birth certificate when you were physically born. We actually give them, when you lead someone to Christ, if you could have one of them and, and actually fill it out right there with them and give them a birth certificate that they've accepted Christ as their Savior. In that, immediately, we're going to start showing them there's a lesson on assurance. We're going to show them that they're saved. Not only are we going to give them assurance of salvation, but then step number 13, we're going to lead him to make a public confession of his faith in Christ. Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. We're going to get them in church. We're going to call them Sunday morning. We're going to do whatever we got to do to get them in church, to get them to make that confession, and then get them baptized and then teach them. Now, let me give you golden key number four, and I'm done. Golden key number four is real simple. Use it or lose it. Well, preacher, man, I like that plan. I'm going to study it. I'm going to memorize it. I'm going to think on it. You'll never probably do anything. Use it. Well, what if I use it and I don't understand it all? What if I don't know, have it all memorized? Then read it. Just give it. Well, what if I mess up? You will. If you're going to try to witness and never mess up, you'll never witness. The only person that ain't ever missed an animal when they're hunting is one that ain't ever hunted. You're going to mess up. Do it anyway. Now I want to close with this. I told you we're starting with an invitation and ending with an invitation. Thank you for your listening ear tonight. But here's what I want to ask you right now. Use it or lose it. I want to ask you tonight, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. January the 6th, 2021, first Wednesday of the year. I want to ask you tonight to make a commitment. And the commitment I want to ask you is take this plan. And in the next seven days, I want you to commit to God tonight that you're going to present this plan to four people. Sometime this week, you're going to, on purpose, present this plan to four individuals. Well, preacher, that's scary. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If we're going to turn our churches around in 2021 with COVID, I'm going to tell you what's going to work. Soul winning and Sunday school. So it's worked for years and we got away from it. Soul winning and Sunday schools. I'm getting in churches that were soul winning machines in the 70s and 80s. And they wonder why they're dying and they've lost people and they're not growing. I don't care what kind of movement's out there. The reason we're dying is because we've got away from soul winning and Sunday school. What's well, the preacher's job? No, it's everyone in here's job. 
Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking. Preacher, I'm going to commit tonight. We're going to pray in a moment. You can come to the altar. But I'm committing tonight that in the next seven days, I'm personally going to make sure that I present this plan to four people. Could I see your hand? You're willing to make that commitment? Hands up all over. I want you to look at that. God bless you. Okay? Hands up all over. Maybe you didn't make that commitment. Maybe you're a little scared. You say, preacher, I'm just not so sure about four. All right, how about this? How about if you didn't raise your hand on four, how many would say, preacher, in the next seven days, I'm going to commit to at least two. I don't know that I can do four, but I want to do something. I don't want to just hear this and let it go. Brother Wilkerson thought enough of all the things I could preach. He wanted me to teach on soul winning. Your pastor has a burden for people. He wants his church to have a burden for people. And education... Our inspiration without education always leads to frustration. You have what you need to win someone to Jesus. Preacher, I'm making a commitment tonight. I can't do four, but I'm going to do two. Can I see your hand? Thank you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to let these gentlemen give the invitation, but here's what I'd say. Don't just sit in your pew. Come to an altar and commit to God tonight. Lord, I'm making a commitment to you that the next seven days, whatever I got to do, whatever it takes, I'm going to present this plan to four people. You will come in here next week rejoicing that you caught someone for Jesus. But you ain't ever going to win anybody if you don't go fish.